Hi, this is Tom Salami of Device Talks. Welcome to the Intuitive Talks podcast. Surgical Robotics presents an enormous opportunity for companies. There are surgeon shortages, sporadic healthcare, and miraculous technological advancement in both robotics and communications. So to understand where this sector is headed, we invited senior executives from Intuitive to share their company's impressive story. Change is coming. Consider these upcoming episodes to be guideposts for the future to follow. Hi, everyone. This is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Intuitive Talks podcast. We have a return guest today. Tony Jark is back. He's now Senior Director of Digital and Machine Learning at Intuitive, and he's going to walk us through how uh, Intuitive is incorporating AI and machine learning into its uh, DaVinci system. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Insight program, the data it collects, how surgeons are using it, how Intuitive engages with surgeons, and a lot of other great topics. And we'll also start the conversation talking about Intuitive's culture. If you want to learn about Tony's background, normally I start these conversations uh, talking about our, or asking our guests about their background. As I said, Tony was on before, so uh, you can uh, find that podcast in the links of the show. So if you want to hear Tony's origin story, but uh, he joined Intuitive straight out of school. Uh, so this is his primary experience in robotics and metal devices. And we'll talk a bit about that, about what it is about Intuitive's culture that uh, that has people staying for a long time. That's something I, I've noticed about Intuitive folks. So I think it speaks well to the people. I think it speaks well to the culture. And I think that'll be reflected. I know that's reflected in the podcast today. But before we begin and before we get into our sponsor messages, I did want to uh, let folks know that Intuitive will be well represented at the Device Talks West meeting, which is coming up on October 18th and 19th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. We'll hear from Dave Rosa, who, of course, is president of Intuitive. We had Dave on the podcast previously. We're going to be following up on his elevation to the president's role, talking about Intuitive's future about its plans, about how it's incorporating different technologies. So I'm really excited to speak with Dave again. We'll also have a presentation by Catherine Rieger, another Intuitive Talks podcast alum. She is Senior Director of Human Factors and User Research at Intuitive, and she's going to be talking about how DaVinci is so darn intuitive for surgeons. So Looking forward to having both Dave Rosa and Catherine Rieger at Device Talks West. Would love to see you there as well. Go to devicetalks.com, find the Device Talks West page and register right there to attend. If you are an employee at Intuitive, uh, please reach out to me or our managing editor, Kayleen Brown on LinkedIn. We'd love to uh, help you get there. So it'd be wonderful to uh, have plenty of Intuitive folks there. We'll have a whole half day of uh, digital surgery robotics discussions. And uh, we also have some other robotics meetings going on at the same time that uh, are just outside of healthcare, but still will be bringing a lot of robotics technical know-how to the Santa Clara Convention Center. Please join us. All right, now, before we begin our interview with Tony Jark of Intuitive, I'd like to bring in our sponsor, TCAN. We're speaking with Johan Horn. He's the Senior Director of R&D at TCAN. Johan, could you tell us about TCAN? Yeah, so TCAN is a leading provider of lab automation equipment, such as liquid handling systems for life science and instrumentation, and we have a 40-year of history. It's our vision to empower our customers to scale healthcare innovation globally. And we do that with two business sectors. The first business sector is life sciences with our TCAN branded product. TCAN's partnering business provides contract development and manufacturing solutions for medical device and life science customers. The R&D group in Morgan Hill brings expertise and capabilities across several key engineering areas, as well as benefits from a close integration with the global TCAN R&D group. Our local R&D team in Morgan Hill provides engineering services in optical design, like microscopy or fluorescent signal detection, fluidic design, robotic motion control, and last but not least, also rapid prototyping with an on-site R&D machine shop. 
So the benefits of Tikan's partnering business approach include the close collaboration between R&D and manufacturing, which ultimately leads to a faster time to market and a reliable product that has designed for manufacturability built in. Thanks, Johan. We'll hear more about Tikan a little later in the podcast. If you want to find out more information right now, go to Tikan's website. It's partnering.tikan, that's T-E-C-A-N. Dot com. Now let's begin this interview with Tony Jark of Intuitive. Well, Tony Jark, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We had you on episode three, so I encourage folks to go back to episode three and learn a little bit about your background. This was in 2021, and it seems like it was in uh, 2001. It was so long ago. That was right during COVID time. So uh, it's nice to talk to you at a, at, a, at a different point in history. As I said, we kind of talked about your background in that podcast. You actually had gone straight to intuitive from school, if I remember correctly, right? There was no, no in between. Yep, that's true. Straight from grad school. That's great. So I want to ask this question, and just so folks know, we don't really throw these questions out in advance, but I've been on Reddit, which sounds like a dangerous thing to say, but on Reddit, I saw someone talking about Intuitive Surgical, what it's like to work there. And then I've had conversations with folks on this podcast who have been at Intuitive forever. Other conversations with folks who say Intuitive gets it right in that they let their people really create and really kind of pursue the technology to its ultimate destination with very little oversight, I'll say, or, or management, not very little, but the right amount, I guess, of oversight and management. I would, I, I'd like to ask you the question, and I'll keep mumbling after uh, I ask it so you have a little time to think about it. How would you describe the culture to someone who wants to work at Intuitive, is an engineer? How do you feel, I don't know, that you, you guys are having the success you're having? I'm guessing culture is a big part of that. But how would you describe that culture to someone who says, what's it like to work there? Yeah, and I, I think it's a great question. And, and I think the, the culture has evolved over the last 12 years that I've been at Intuitive. But I think consistent to that is the innovation aspect of it. I very much enjoy working at Intuitive because we're surrounded by experts on various technologies from robotics controls to mechanical engineering to imaging and advanced visualization to machine learning to analytics to molecules and being able to work at the intersection of all of those technologies with the world leading experts who are also humble and hungry and collaborative allows for really exciting solutions to emerge. I think that's one component. I think the other component is that I think ingrained in intuitive is the persistence to pursue meaningful problems. We tend to not just chase technology for the sake of technology. I think we're reminded that it's patients first always. We're keen to address the quadruple aim. And so that goes down to the engineer that's working on a component of an arm to my role running parts of the digital organization to leadership. And I think that helps keep people focused and able to iterate, experiment, fail, but then ultimately succeed on some of these technologies. What's it like for your engineers who work on a system and sort of are able to see its release? We'll talk a little bit later about the Insight Suite product, but uh, it's got to be a good feeling. And we talk about this a lot in medical devices. Having known you spent your last four or five years of your life working on something that's actually getting into the hands of surgeons and ultimately delivering better care for patients. What's that feeling like for folks? I think it's massively rewarding. Uh, I think the work that we all pursue at Intuitive is hard. It's it's long. It's incredibly detailed to validate and ensure that that product is as ready as possible to kind of meet that customer's expectations. And they're not light lifts, right? I think I think it's critically evaluated at all stages from concept through early design, iteration, and research to translation to then ultimately release of that initial product that then goes through the, the refinements of, of any early product. So I, I hope the teams are proud of any launch. I, I'm always impressed at the platform teams when they launch new instruments or physical robots or things like this. There's just an impressive engineering feat associated with these complex systems on the digital side. I think similarly, there's a lot of complexity that goes into managing data that comes off our systems and serving it back to surgeons in an interpretable way. A lot of respect to those teams and hopefully they have delight and satisfaction there. So. Just going back to the sort of the initial question, you did answer it, but uh, an engineer who's talking to you about working at Intuitive, what's uh, what's your overall messaging to them? I think it's, do they want to be in an environment that is surrounded by amazing expertise, asking for people who are great problem solvers? We leverage technology, but, but we look for people who can take loosely defined spaces, understand customer expectations, and then deliver technology that meets it. 
the reason I think about that is in my space, I think machine learning and AI, the tools are are changing so quickly, driven by industry. The the common thread is someone who can take a problem statement or, or thesis and be able to translate it down into a set of solutions or candidate solutions that then ultimately can be deployed in the product. So anyway, I, I think it's like you're thirsty for hard problems, strong collaborations, but but high expectations. I've been here 12 years because that never gets old. I think it's that's, that's it's great. one of the most yeah most energizing things you can have. No, like I've said, I'm going to make this comment a lot. I'm always impressed at the length of years that folks I talk to have been there. And there's not a lot of turnover from what I can see from the podcast perspective. Anyway. I, you brought- I feel junior. <laughs> You're the kid? <laughs> The new guy. Let me let yeah. me show you the cafeteria. New guy. Well, let's talk about AI and machine learning. We hit upon it a bit in our interview that we did in 2021. Obviously, it's taken on, I think, a new tone and a lot more of a buzzword than it was. So, I, I would like this conversation to be substantive. I, I don't just want to use the word AI or machine learning just for the sake of using the word. So, I want to understand where intuitive how you're incorporating this into insight and into other elements of your system as well. But before I do, I was Googling, of course, before I got here, just to kind of prep for things. And I found an article in science, just the abstract, because I couldn't access the article, that basically talked about surgical robotics in AI. And within that, they talked a lot about autonomous robots performing procedures. I mean, I read that and I was kind of like, well, we're not talking about that yet. But are we talking about that yet? Is that, is that a conversation that you ever have or, or, or is that something that's, again, you might see in a science magazine, but you're not going to necessarily see in an OR in the next five or six years? Yeah, yeah. I think um, we've been fortunate enough to, to support and collaborate with a lot of academic teams that have been studying autonomous surgery on top of uh, research kits that we provide to them and other platforms. And so I think there's, a, there's an exciting space there. I think that said, uh, at Intuitive, there, there's a, a huge runway of more augmenting capabilities in the near term, right? So we can light up structures that you know, with imaging agents that allow you to see more clearly. We can be able to provide help in navigating to distal parts of the lung within our ION platform. Um, and then in, in my space, we can leverage machine learning to be able to decipher data that comes off the systems to surface insights to surgeons that are clinically relevant. And those are just some examples. There are many other places that we see machine learning as a tool, as just one component of the overall solution, but a tool that we can use. So I would say augmenting is, is the near term. Augmenting. Augmenting yeah. is near term. Great. So let's talk first about your role. You, I mentioned, I think, at the top, Senior Director of Digital and Machine Learning at, at Intuitive. Explain, if you would, what you oversee at the company, and then we'll, we'll start getting into how you're applying that to Intuitive products. Sure. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to lead the surgeon experience vertical. So we, we lead product management for our digital tools that surface into a surgeon's hands. So my intuitive application and the supporting sub applications in, in that product. Uh, we also have launched some new capabilities called Case Insights and Insights Engine that empower surgeons with, with new features and then allow surgeon scientists to interrogate and study uh, information from our robotic systems. I also lead a machine learning and data science team uh, that builds many of the algorithms that go into those products, along with some supporting engineering teams uh, to be able to build out those pipelines. I, I love the term surgeon scientist. Is that, is that copywritten? Because I may steal that for a future podcast. What is a surgeon scientist? How do you define that? Yeah, it's something that we've been we've been using for a couple of years now, and we've been trying to support the broader field of surgical data science through engaging with societies, engaging with various academic teams, and really empowering investigator-led research. And so we, we I guess we define a surgeon scientist as someone who wants to study what makes great surgery on the back of our technologies. And that differs from a, a surgeon who wants to perform great surgery. They're overlapping, right? They, they could be the same thing, but some want to receive some of that information and, and be able to improve how they treat the next patient. Others want to interrogate and beyond the, the tip of the innovation sphere of, of how to usher in new capabilities like quantitative feedback or post-operative video review and highlights and personalized learning loops with outside OR practice and simulation. And, and we want to invite those surgeon scientists into our digital platforms to be, be able to discover how to influence insights and surgeon feedback. So are you, it sounds as if a surgeon scientist is someone who incorporates data in their introspection, professional introspection into how they're performing surgery into their training, whereas another surgeon may just feel a repetition of a procedure is the best way to improve? I think that most surgeons are interested in understanding how to do great surgery. Sure. Right? Yeah. And so I think, I think we want to be able to deliver tools that allow them to do that as efficiently as possible, just like our, our robotic platform and the instruments in theory allow 
for improved efficiency and, and dexterity and control during surgery. I think on the digital side, we can surface information from surgical episodes or across their case history that allow them to learn more effectively or un- uncover insights on outliers or trends. The surgeon scientist, I think, is one that, that dives a bit deeper, right? And they want to publish, they want to present, they're at podiums. They're kind of ushering in how to harness some of these new capabilities. And so we've been fortunate. Many of the surgeon scientists that we've supported are now publishing and presenting at most major societies every quarter. Uh, they're self-organizing groups. For example, alongside American College of Surgeons in October, they have a group that they're self-organizing. And, and then we had intuitive host symposia to be able to facilitate collaborations among the different academic teams. It's an emerging field, and we want to invest in the foundations of the field that probably expand beyond intuitive because we see it as quite exciting. Um, but we believe that some of the digital tools and the data that flow from our systems are incredibly powerful and accelerating to their hypotheses. Very cool. Well, let, let's get it. Let's talk about that. So, we'll take a quick break from this conversation to bring back Johan Horn of. TCAN. Johan is the Senior Director of R&D at TCAN. Johan, tell me, how does TCAN work with medical device companies? We have an in-depth understanding of our customer applications and workflows, and we have a face gate approach to design and development, and we support researchers only in regulated devices. Our face gate approach has a couple of phases, starting off with phase zero, discovery and ideation. Then we have a feasibility phase, followed by phase two alpha prototype development and a regression beta prototype phase. And lastly, a verification and validation phase that is concurrent with the manufacturing transfer so that we save time to go from development into manufacturing. Ultimately, this phase gate approach ensures that the project stays on track and will be delivered in quality and on time for our customers. And finally, Johan, TCAN has so much going on. Can you give us an update on new services and new developments at the company? So TCAN recently acquired Pyramid Corporation. Pyramid is a contract development and manufacturing firm with sites in Northern California, Boston, and Malaysia. We're in the process of building up a hub in the San Jose area in Northern California. We have a pyramid factory, R&D consisting of system level product development and liquid handling components, and we're vertically integrated with a machine shop to mitigate supply chain challenges. The co-location of our development and manufacturing teams allows us to design for manufacturability and integrate supply chain early on. And it also enables a seamless transfer from R&D to manufacturing which is a key differentiator for us to speed up the development time. Our R&D team is 400 engineers and scientists strong globally. We therefore can locally here in Morgan Hill leverage those expertises and together with the vetted global and regulatory team and infrastructure, we can provide the stability of a trusted partner to our customers. All of this helps us bring a more reliable product to the market faster. That's interesting, Johan. How do you see the industry changing in the future? Uh, That is a very good question. The regulatory landscape is continually evolving for medical devices and IVD, and we can provide regulatory strategy support and expertise as part of our value proposition. Digitization is also more and more important for our customers, and we are deploying a growing portfolio of digital solutions to our customers, like a service cockpit, a connect app, or predictive health monitoring. Agile product development is another area that is important for our customers in order to speed up the product development time. And then artificial intelligence is becoming more and more prevalent in the medical device and diagnostic sectors. TCAN is already incorporating key elements of artificial intelligence and machine learning across several of our offerings with more to come. Now, adapting to this constantly changing industry is key for our vision to scale healthcare innovation globally. And we continue to drive this mission by supporting our customers. Terrific. Thanks, Johan. And thanks, TCAN, for sponsoring this episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast. And if you'd like to find out more information about TCAN, go to this website, partnering.tcan.com. 
And TCAN is spelled T E C A N. How is Intuitive incorporating AI? And, and I don't know if I want to say AI and machine learning all the time. So let's just say AI, if they're applied at the same time on the same projects, then feel free to tell me that. But how are you incorporating artificial intelligence in, uh, in what you've done? And, and we can, I don't know if we're going to talk specifically about Insight Suite or if it goes beyond that, but where can AI be found and in what Intuitive is offering? Sure. I mean, maybe if we start close to the work that our team has been driving and then we can go broader. The Case Insights uh, offering that, that's just recently entered into limited launch uses machine learning to be able to uncover the relevant portions of surgery. So we we recognize when certain activities are happening from the various data streams from the robot. We recognize what's in the image, and then we surface that information back to surgeons through their digital applications so that they can quickly jump to relevant sections of, of the surgical video and the surgical data to be able to hopefully learn something or drive some sort of improved understanding of how to do better surgery the next time around or um, on, on future patients. We also have used machine learning to be able to build models that surface quantitative feedback. We call these objective performance indicators, which we think are really exciting. I think the ability to bring quantitative information to provide feedback to surgeons versus subjective ratings like questionnaires or rating scales or just verbal feedback. It's not replacing it. It's it's augmenting it and complementing it, but it offers an immense potential to be able to accelerate learning, address bias that might exist through subjective feedback. And so we, we use machine learning to be able to build out models to extract that information as well. How is the information being collected for this this learning? Is it all through the motion of the, the robotic, the da Vinci arms, the robotic arms? Or are there other sources of input cameras or whatnot? What else you might have? What what sort of data set are you looking at? Yeah, I mean, it, we're super fortunate to be one company here, building the robot and then building the digital tools outside of it. So we absolutely see the robot as a, an information system, right? It, it has a surgeon sitting down holding on to hand controllers, and then there's a computer that's filtering that information and then delivering it to the instruments that then operate on the patient. And so we're able to tap into the the data streams that are flowing through the system, those include the arm movements, the button presses that the surgeon makes, but also the endoscopic video, um, which is very important. And so we use all of that information in our downstream algorithms and in, in terms of the feedback we can provide to surgeons. Some is more important in some situations than others, but it's it's quite powerful. What does that feedback look like? Is the, is the surgeon being emailed a link to something where they can look at data? Is it is it more comprehensive to that? What what are they, what kind of information are they getting? Yeah, I think we're continuing to strive for the most seamless experience that kind of services the information that's most relevant at the right time. To do that, you know, the surgeon would sit down and log in to our robot and then they would do surgery. And in the background, we would have the ability to record the information, those data streams we just talked about through what's called Intuitive Hub. And it would find its way into the My Intuitive app that surgeons use to be able to look at their case history. So they'd sit down, log in, and then after the surgery, they'd get a notification that a new new insight is in My Intuitive. They would log into My Intuitive and be able to review objective metrics across that entire surgery, how long it took, what instruments were used, but also dive in to look at the video and look at particular activities that happen throughout that video coupled to objective metrics. And why we think that's interesting is over the last 10 years, we've we've worked with academic institutions to show that objective metrics from the overall surgery, but also more importantly, from particular parts of the surgery, for example, the anastomosis and prostatectomy tend to strongly correlate with post-operative outcomes. Mm. And so we see that as an opportunity to be able to surface those insights back to surgeons to allow them to focus on what might be most critical for either patient care or safety or, or efficiencies. Separate from intuitive, I'm just I'm curious, do you have a sense of how many surgical procedures are recorded in some form of fashion and video or, or whatnot. It seems like it, as you're talking, it would seem to me to be a no brainer that this should be something that's available to everybody. Yet I don't know if this is still the minority, if this is only surgeries that are done through a robotic assisted surgery or through other means. Obviously there's probably interior recordings, but what kind of record in the past has there been of, of surgical procedures? This is just my perspective. I, I don't think it's necessarily consistent. I think there are surgeons and institutions that were routinely record uh, videos from robotic platforms and laparoscopic endoscopes and things like this. 
and then that there are, there are others that that don't because they they aren't yet sure how to harness that information or sure how that information should be used. And so I think we're at a, a point in time where more surgeons, more institutions, more societies, and more companies are able to make actionable in a responsible and secure and, and transparent way insights from that information that allow surgeons to perform or hospitals to better understand how to drive efficiency. So I, I, I think it hasn't been consistent. We've seen some people do it all the time. Some people never do it, but we're hoping to enter into the space responsibly and with immense respect to data security and transparency to, to be able to, to ensure that we can impact surgery. The, the opportunity here is so great, right? The, the opportunity to measure quantitatively what's happening in surgery to help surgeons improve how they treat patients is an opportunity we don't want to miss. Sure. So talk a bit more about the Insight platform. Is this something that's that's in addition to, and I know you're in a limited launch right now, so every every system, is it only for DaVinci or is it for other systems as well? First it's of all. For DaVinci, yes. For DaVinci, okay. Is it something that's incorporate will be incorporated into future systems by default or is it an additional product that someone would be bringing in? How do you see it being made available more broadly in the future when it's when it's ready for a full release? Yeah. So, so right now we're, we're kind of adding it on to our systems. I think we always have the opportunity to include and bundle uh, in the future with all the things. I think that's something that um, we want people to invest in the total ecosystem. We think that they're complementary in nature. So the ability to use the, the system and then benefit from some of the digital tools that surface the deepest and most relevant insights from our robotic systems, I think can be provided there. So, so I'd say it's been launched on the back of, of XI in the future. There's opportunity to go in in different directions. I think the phase we're in right now is launch and work with our early partners and customers to refine the product and then also really interrogate the value that it brings back to the customers in terms of improving personalized learning, improving efficiency, reducing variability, and, and hopefully improving quality of surgery through patient outcomes. Sure. Curious, what does the upgrade look like? I'm making it sound like you're attaching this other box to something. Is it just some software that you're already putting into the system because all the pieces are already there or is it more complex than that? So Case Insights is enabled by Intuitive Hub. It is an additional piece of hardware that we attach to the system that orchestrates okay. many things beyond Case Insights. It, it has other capabilities associated with it, but it allows us to do some edge compute and processing that then ultimately allows us to deliver data into my Intuitive application where Case Insights and Insights Engine sit. I, I didn't touch on it before, but, but we've, we've talked a lot about Case Insights. That's what we hope you know, every surgeon can use after every surgery they do on DaVinci. Insights Engine is a, a low-code platform for surgeon scientists to study the data that flows through Case Insights and other digital applications to understand what makes good surgery. So mm. you can imagine them asking a very clinical question of like, does how I bend my wrists during the anastomosis of a prostatectomy impact post-operative outcome A, and they can do that via a few clicks. And the reason we're doing that is we want to complement those innovators with the broader group of individuals that are using our tools to improve day-to-day -day practice. Interesting. Do they have access to only their data from their own procedures or is there aggregated data obviously would be anonymous, but that they're able to compare their methods to, to other certain scientists? Yeah. So in, in our digital solutions, we tend to include aggregated benchmarks. So you can look at population averages or things like this, or within some of our new offerings, we're able to allow hospitals to define those benchmarks are defined the what good looks like type of videos that someone can reference for a given person or a given step. Within our Insights Engine tool, we allow surgeons to be able to collaborate with one another in a de-identified way. So oftentimes, if, if you want to understand the impact of a simulation curriculum on intraoperative performance, you run a study across multiple surgeons and you study the impact across multiple surgeons that are subject to two arms of a study, some that get some practice and some that don't get some practice or something like this. And those are the types of studies we work to facilitate through the Insights Engine platform. But we're really trying to break down the barriers for people to not have to, to deal with the data collection side of things and the early data pre-processing and, and be able to ask the clinical question directly. And we see similar things happening in other domains outside of surgery, right? We can ask really powerful questions to search engines and have things return on the back of large language models. I think we're trying to follow suit and empower the surgeon scientists that have the great questions on top of our platform. And how do you engage or when do you engage the surgeons to understand what information they want, how they want these reports to be received? Because you ultimately don't want to give them something that they're, it's just too complicated. They're not going to use it. It could be the greatest thing in the world. But if they're like, I don't have the 20 minutes to spare to do that. When do you get working with surgeons to understand the data they need and how it should be provided? 
I think that's the one of the hardest things about launching products, right? Yeah. Um, I think the easy part is oftentimes doing technical feasibility or building initial algorithms that get you 80, 90% of the way there, but but actually delivering it to the end customer in a way that is meaningful, interpretable, usable, and ultimately vital to what they do is what makes good product or great product from okay product or failed product. And so in terms of, of how we've approached it, we we work super closely with surgeons from the very beginning. And so we we tend to have collaborators and surgeons that that give us feedback, both internal medical officers, but also external surgeons on some of our product concepts. And then when we kind of go into either a research launch or a, or a limited launch, we work very closely with those institutions and, and we we listen and, and attempt to iterate and measure the impact of, of some of those changes. And one of the things that our team has benefited greatly from is working very, like our, our data scientists and machine learning scientists and product managers work very directly with our with our end customers. And I think being able to work very, very closely with them allows them to ask questions, interrogate, iterate, prototype, um, and then ultimately land on a what our best guess would be for an early product. But you know what we see today in many of our digital tools, just like what we see today in robotics will evolve. Um, digital will evolve even more quickly. So I expect the teams to go through some pretty exciting iterations with the data we can surface, the information we can surface, how tailored it can be to drive actionable change in surgical practice over the next couple of years. I think that that's it's going to be an exciting time. Do you anticipate that most, there are other companies in the field that are developing surgical robotic systems? You guys obviously have an enormous head start, but will every system include some version of AI? Or are we just sort of, is, is just default going to be part of anything going forward? Or, or is it something that's unique? When someone says they're using AI, they're, they're distinguishing themselves from another surgical robotic system. I think it's a great question, and I can't speak for all companies out there, but but I think it's a, a critical component. I, I think leveraging machine learning and, and AI now in, in the current state of things, it, it, I think, is critical for many companies. I think getting the platform right is stage one, right? Like, it, you know, the, the downstream artificial intelligence doesn't always mean anything if if the surgical robot isn't performing well, right? And so I think that's that's number one. I think once it is performing well, I think being able to understand again how to leverage machine learning as just one component right how the platform functions how the instruments work what instruments you have what imaging capabilities you have what training services you provide etc the total picture that then machine learning again is one component that then allows you to maybe solve some problems downstream or in the middle of the intersection of those technologies and services that's a great point no you're right it's the, it's only as good as the data that's coming in are you drawing from any years past, any data from years past to incorporate that into into insights? Is that sort of what's going to provide some guidance going forward? Or are we starting now moving moving on from this point whenever the limited launch happened? Yeah, we've been able to work internally on many of our algorithms with data sets and VR and synthetic and other places. We've been able to work with some of our clinical collaborators to vet out some of these objective mm. performance indicators that they published on and they continue to publish on in peer-reviewed journals. And so we're able to leverage a lot of that work to be able to ensure that we're as close as we can be to meaningful insights being provided through our digital applications. But we've got a lot to learn. And and I think one of the opportunities at Intuitive is if these technologies, if these digital solutions are useful to surgeons and are filling unmet needs, we have a large install base and we have a lot of procedures that are being done. And the more data that flows through from different ways of doing surgery, uh, different skill sets of surgeons would allow us to kind of learn best practices and hopefully help kind of the bottom quartile or the bottom half of, of surgeons uncover ways that they can potentially deliver better care. So I think with more data, we'll have more learnings. Um, I think one exciting thing is we've been fortunate enough to work with collaborators. Again, this technology has foundations and research for the last decade, but we've been able to work with collaborators across the world with our platforms in, in Europe and in Asia and, and things like this. And it, I think the opportunity to address uh, at a global scale, different ways that surgeons do surgery, different ways that patients are treated on a patient care pathway is a formidable challenge. And I think one that requires customization, configuration, and and kind of some pretty thoughtful, meaningful work. I I don't think it's going to be easy, but I think we'll be able to chip away at it and, and hopefully improve care. Very cool. Last question. You mentioned at the start when I asked my ridiculous question about autonomous surgical robotics, you talked about augmenting. What will that look like with your capabilities in AI and machine learning going forward, if not this year, next year? Are, are we already? Are you already at a point where 
people always equate it to driving a car where you're crossing lanes and the car tells you, no, 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 like you're stare back to the left. Is Da Vinci at that point yet where you're giving surgeons that kind of guidance? Or does this lead to that point where the surgical robotic system is a little more involved in guiding the surgery while it's happening as opposed to just giving the surgeon post-procedure information? I don't want to be like, make light about it, that they can build their skill set off of. Our longer term goal is definitely impact the patient before they're off outside the OR, right? Like when they're in there for surgery, we want to make sure that surgery goes as well as it possibly can. And so we can't just always rely on post-operative insights and feedback. We, we want to be able to influence the course of surgery. And, and I think we have some technologies that do that today in terms of augmenting how a surgeon does surgery. Our advanced instrumentation senses certain properties of tissue. For example, our stapler will sense whether it has a good kind of tissue clamping to be able to then ensure that the firing of the stapler is as, as confident as it can be. And, and surgeons are now relying on that. It's kind of, you can think of it as, you know, augmenting capabilities of staying in a lane in a car or something like this. I think some of our imaging capabilities like fluorescence imaging allow us to light up structures in the body that then allow a surgeon to not have to guess from a white light image alone where some structures might be. Therefore, it allows them to potentially make better decisions. So I think that the things we learn post-operatively, we hope over time can find their way increasingly into the course of surgery to provide guidance before the operation is over and, and before the patient leaves the operating room. Fantastic. All right. Well, interesting, fascinating stuff as always. Tony Jarek, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tom. It was a pleasure. Well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast. Thanks to Tony Jark for joining us. Thanks to our sponsor, TCAN, for making this all possible. And thanks, of course, to you. We'd love to have you, if you would, share this episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast on social media channels. You can also subscribe to the Device Talks podcast network so you don't miss a future episode of Intuitive Talks or our other great podcasts, and there's plenty coming, uh, subscribe to the Device Talks podcast network on any major podcast player, Apple, Google, Spotify, et cetera. And uh, you'll get a lot of great device content, device interviews, device, device insights coming your way. Once again, you need to be at Device Talks West. It's happening on October 18th, 19th. On October 18th, we'll be hearing from Catherine Rieger, who is uh, oversees human factor design at Intuitive. She'll give a great presentation. And on October 19th, Dave Rosa, president of Intuitive, will be uh, sitting down with me for a keynote interview. So we'd love to see you at Device Talks West. Go to devicetalks.com to register. If you are an employee at Intuitive and want to attend, send me a message on LinkedIn. Quick DM, and uh, I'll take care of that for you. We'll get you at Device Talks West. Would be wonderful to see uh, uh, folks from Intuitive at Device Talks West. It's at the Santa Clara Convention Center. It is not far away, and it's going to be a fantastic two days. We're going to talk a lot about surgical robotics. We're going to talk a lot with Intuitive folks, and I uh, hope you'll join us there. So once again, that's a wrap of this episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be bringing you another episode very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.